Well, it's great to see you guys here today. Let's go ahead and take out your Bibles. If you haven't already, turn to chapter 5, verse 21 of the book of 1 Timothy. We've been making our way through here for a little while, and uh, we're coming close to the end here. We're getting there. Oh, good. My battery's running low. (laughs) Chair, can you grab my uh, power cord back in the back before I get started here? Let's um, make sure my computer doesn't die on me in the middle of my sermon. All right. Well, as she's doing that, um, as you recall, we've been going through this book and looking at uh, just a lot of the qualifications for ministers, qualifications for elders as they are serving in the church. Um, You remember that Paul is is now speaking to Timothy about... uh, the situation as Paul left that church there in Ephesus, now it's about five to eight years later. Paul has gone to prison up in Rome. He's been released. Now he comes back down to find the church that he once planted, that he once really prophesied about and said, you know, I I know there's going to come a day when I leave here that wolves are going to come in here and and just destroy this place if you don't hold to the, the principles of Scripture. And so there's that concern that Paul had. And now as he returns and finds this church that, that wolves have come in. Right there. Wolves have come in and, and uh, false teachers have come in and they've kind of wrecked the place a little bit. And so now this, uh, this sermon or this, uh, this teaching that Paul gives, this letter that Paul writes to Timothy is designed to set the church back on the right path. And, and so we've been looking at these principles as we've gone through here. And uh, again, qualifications of ministers, qualifications for deacons and elders. Uh, and, and so as we've gotten into chapter 5, he begins to talk about you know, not rebuking elders, uh, looking at the family situation in the church that you know those that are older than you, Timothy, they're your dads. The older men, they're your dads. And so don't rebuke them. Treat them like your father. And, and the mothers, or the older women, are your mothers. And, and on and on he went with that. And so as we come to the end of chapter 5 now, now Paul begins to say there in verse 21, <clears throat> I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, doing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine uh, for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. Some men's sins are clearly evident preceding them to judgment, but those, uh, but those of some men follow later. Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning, Lord, realizing the power of these things for the church, the, uh, the importance that we, we see in these verses, Lord, cannot be understated. And, and we thank you, Lord, for giving these things to us, giving them to Paul, to Timothy, and now on to us 2,000 years later. Father, and we ask that today that you would give us a clear understanding of these things, uh, an interpretation of them, Lord, that is according to your word, and an application here in this body of believers that will bring you honor and glory as the years pass. We praise you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, um, you know, for a pastor, for anybody in leadership within a church, uh, these verses are uh, very poignant. (laughs) And I would say to you, as a pastor who has served, I don't know, now I think 12 years as a pastor, uh, I have um, known these verses very well, and yet I have not practiced them every, every time when I've looked out to see uh, who could help in the ministry and people that want to help, you know, oftentimes there, there comes this, this real struggle as you begin to think about who can serve as an assistant pastor, who can serve as an elder, who can come on as a deacon, who could serve over in the children's ministry and those kind of places. You know, patience and prudence doesn't always take the, uh, the high place that it should. And sometimes we make decisions that are based on, wow, 
he's really charismatic, you know, or she's really got a way with kids, you know, or something like that, rather than, you know, really taking the time and, and saying, no, we're not going to lay hands on people too quickly. We're not going to do that because that's what these verses say. Don't rush to judgment as far as letting people come in to the church. And I was thinking about that in the sense of, uh, you know, Paul just say, hey, observe these things. And you could take that for everything he said to this point and then on through the rest of it or just the little passage that we're looking at today. But uh, again, Paul's speaking directly to Timothy. Timothy, you've got to think about these things. You've got to observe these things in order to make things right there in that fellowship. And so as we think about this here today, I was uh, just reminded of just the times that I've been a, a hiring manager or, or just gone into interviews myself and that struggle that we have as employer-employee relationships, you know. Um, when you're interviewing people that come in the door, really all you know about them is what they've written on that piece of paper. And it might be right, it might be wrong. <laughs> it might be uh, truthful, it might be a pack of lies. And so it's your job to kind of figure that out and to, to decide and a lot of times it's the same way in the body of Christ as people come in. You know, we don't know anything about them as they walk through that door. Uh, and sometimes people come right in and say, hey, I want to serve. You know, I want to get involved. And what do I do? You know, how can I serve? And, and there is that temptation to let them go ahead and serve. But then we hear that echo in our ear about what Paul said. Hey, watch out. You don't want to share in that person's sin. You don't know what kind of person that is. They may have an appearance of just everything's great on the outside, but on the inside, what's going on? And so we want to take that time to uh, observe these things, as Paul says. Um, sometimes you get um, uh, a situation where uh, somebody wants you to write a recommendation for them. You know, hey, uh, I'm getting, trying to get this job. You know, give me a letter of reference. And, and, and sometimes you, oh, boy, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I want to give them that letter of recommendation. You don't want to be mean, though, and you don't want to see their career suffer and those kind of things. And one uh, college professor was in that situation. Somebody asked him to write a reference letter, and so this is what he wrote, being a, a, an English major. He said, I am pleased to say this candidate is a former colleague of mine. In my opinion, you will be fortunate to get this person to work for you. I recommend him with no qualifications whatsoever. No person would be better for the job. Did you get that one? No person would. Just don't hire anybody to be better than this guy. I urge you to waste no time in making this candidate an offer of employment. All in all, and without reservations, I, can say, I cannot say enough good things about him, nor can I recommend him too highly. Yeah, that's, that's a great recommendation. Wait a minute. Is it? I don't know. It's a, it's a little cloudy there. But again, you know, we have these problems. We have these kind of situations in the church. Uh, we just don't know. Sometimes it's a situation where he was going to church or they were going to church on the other side of town. I know the pastor real well. I can just call him up. Hey, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Oh, he's the greatest. You know, absolutely. Put him in there. Let him serve. But oftentimes you have no idea. But still, the call for Paul here is, hey, don't be prejudicious against them. Just be patient, and their good works will either show or their bad works will come through. And so there's a, there's a, a real call for patience and prudence in, in laying hands on people too suddenly. Um, and so Paul, you know, again, he's been talking about these qualifications, and he gives us this idea. You need to test people and, and really find out in the, in the midst of that test and that trial, things will come to light and, and so there is this qualification that needs to be met, as we looked at back in chapter 3. In verse 6, he said, hey, make sure they're not a novice, you know. Make sure they're not a, just a beginner in this. We want to make sure they're, they're qualified. Lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach. What are people on the outside saying about him? Uh, let's, let's really test this thing out and make sure this person is the right person for the position. Again, in uh, verse 10, ta talking about deacons now, he says, But let these also be tested, and then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. And so this, this trial, this qualification period of just testing somebody before we lay hands on them, and then ultimately now Paul is saying, uh, don't hastily 
rush to lay hands on somebody to bring them into the ministry. Well, it goes back to what Jesus says, right? Jesus said, hey, uh, you know, every good tree, it bears good fruit. And it's just such a logical thing to understand the way Jesus puts it. It's so basic. A bad tree bears bad fruit. Uh, as we were talking about this a couple of months ago in the, in the men's uh, breakfast on a Saturday, we were talking about this same idea. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're drilling for oil and oil comes out of that hole in the ground, you know you've hit an oil well. You, you know you've hit a, an oil pocket. If water comes out of there, you know you've hit water. It's just, it's just very basic and it's easy for us to understand that idea. Uh, if it's a good tree, good fruit is going to come out of that tree. If it's a bad tree, bad fruit is going to come out. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And so it's just so basic for us to understand. But again, there's that pressure uh, to want to bring people in, to want to make them feel a part of the team. And, and I have struggled with that mightily. I'll tell you, the worst situation, I'll just give you one of my own little uh, faux pas here that I messed up on. Early, my first church that I was pastoring out in California, we had a guy who, you know, he was a nice guy, but he wasn't employed at the time that I met him and I ended up giving him a job at the place I was working and just helped him along and and he just seemed to be growing in the Lord and and things were going well and and I found out that he used to um, do some acting and voice acting and character acting a little bit in Hollywood on a real uh, low level but uh, he had a nice voice you know and I thought boy he'd be a good guy to read the announcements and I needed somebody to read the announcements and so I gave him the opportunity to stand up in front of the church as you saw Barry doing this morning and read the announcements and uh, he did a great job for a while for us and and uh, as time went on we were kind of bringing him into our home a little bit and uh just a situation with his daughter needing daycare and him helping me at the, at the, at the office. It was just a, a, an easy situation for him to come over to our house from time to time. And, and we had him uh, come over for dinner a few times and, and watch a movie with us on a Friday night. Anyway, as time went on, out of the blue one day, he, uh, he's a little bit of an older guy at the time. I think he was about 56. He announced to me that he was in love with my 14-year-old daughter. And, uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I said. What? <laughs> and, uh, you know, just a, a total mind blower. You know, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. There's no way we could have saw this about this guy. And I, you know, I immediately had him step down from serving in that capacity. But eventually I had to tell him, you got to get out of here, man. you got to leave the church. You just need to go. Because he just wouldn't drop it. He wouldn't repent of it. And, um you know, it was, a, it was a real shock for my family and I. But that passage just rang in my ears. You laid hands on that guy too quickly. You didn't give the time necessary to find out what was really going on in this guy's heart, in this guy's mind. And, and, and you know, obviously, uh, we nipped it in the bud before it got too bad. But um, situations like that can destroy churches absolutely destroy churches and so you'd think I would have learned after that incident but I've, I haven't I've, I've done it many times I'm a guy that likes to give people a second chance you know I like to see people get a second chance in ministry get a second chance in life and and uh, because of that you know just the way I'm made up uh, I give people chances and oftentimes uh, too much and too soon and so that's a real concern for Paul here, and it should be a concern for us. And so he says, observe these things. Uh, observe them without prejudice or partiality, first of all, in those first couple of verses. And we're going to mix the verses around here because there's a verse that's kind of thrown right into the middle of that when he starts talking about drinking wine and not water. And so we're going to hop around a little bit, but we're going to try to keep it in context with this idea. Uh, and then the last part there, uh, patience and purity. Don't put yourself in that position of um, sacrificing your own purity and the purity of the church because you weren't patient. And so we'll look at those things here today. Well, of course, you can go back all the way through the Bible to the beginning of the nation of Israel 
Uh, you can look at, um, you know, the, the children of Israel. They said, hey, you know, we want a king just like the rest of the nations around us. At one point, you know, God said, I want you to be governed by me. You don't need a king. You don't need a, a leader. I want you to be governed by me and by my word and by my laws. And so, but they kept crying. We want a king just like everybody else. Well, what kind of king do you think they wanted? Hey, we want some big, handsome stud like this guy Saul over here, you know. And, uh, and of course, that's what, not God's man at all. But because of our prejudice, because of our uh, prejudicial thinking and our partiality towards people that appear uh, a certain way, we make false judgments. We make the wrong judgments about people and don't say, God, who is your man? Who is your man? What's the man you want for this job? Or what's the woman? who is the woman you want for this job? And pray about those things diligently. We don't do that, and then so we put somebody into a position uh, that, that God didn't want in that position. You remember who God's man was? David. This little, this little kid that's out in the fields, you know, taking care of the sheep and stuff. He's got the heart of God. That's the, that's the man God chose, but the people chose the big handsome stud that's head and shoulders above everybody else, right? The good-looking guy. And we know how that turned out. We know that in the nation of Israel, along, along the time that Jesus came around, that the priesthood was completely corrupted. That the high priest and that whole priesthood system, it was all based on, hey, who's going to take over next? Well, it's going to be my son, of course. You know, just like all the other corrupt kingdoms around, it was just handed down from family to family. And, and it wasn't God's man that was in charge. It was, uh, hey, who's, who's the guy running this little mob we got going here? And, uh, and so, so often, uh, leadership is chosen with prejudice. It's chosen with partiality. And in the church, the darkest hours of the church age uh, are known here, as you see on the screen, as the midnight of the dark ages. This time period, 858 to 1046, was just the darkest period within the church age because the priesthood had been completely taken over with not godly men, not men who were called by God to be pastors and ministers and bishops and deacons and all those kind of things. It was the guys who were in power, the guys who were in the right family, the guys who had the right connection, the good old boy network kind of a thing had completely taken over the church at this time. And so you had popes that were uh, womanizers and they were sleeping around and having like a brothel uh, going on within the church and uh, murder and every, every unspeakable sin that you can imagine was happening at the highest levels of the church because of what we're looking at here today. And so, you know, again, it can go from, hey, we got the wrong guy reading the announcements to we got a pastor, we got a priest, we got a, a bishop in charge of this church that is completely corrupt. He's not God's man at all. And so there are real concerns as we look at this kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, we can have situations within the church where uh, splits happen. We can have just uh, scandals that get seen on national television that not only give that church a black eye, but the whole church, the whole family of God can be damaged severely by not adhering and observing the things that Paul is talking about right here today. And so um, this idea of laying hands on, it's the idea of, you know, don't lay hands on them too quickly. Don't agree that they are God's man. Don't agree that they're God's woman, that they're uh, godly people. Don't ordain them is, is kind of what we've turned that into be. Don't lay hands on them and agree that they are the person called for this time and for this moment too quickly because you just don't know. And, and so you see this idea of hands being laid on for the ministry early on in the book of Acts. You see there in Acts 6.6, 6, they, the they were set before the apostles uh, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them, the idea of ordaining them for the ministry. Acts 13.3 again, then having fasted and prayed they, and la laid hands on them, they sent them away, sent them out into the ministry, sent them to go forth to preach the gospel. 
to go forth and minister as the ministers of God. And so that's the idea that we're looking at here today. And so again, I want to read those verses for you uh, up on the screen. And uh, it says there, I charge you before God. And, and Paul does this a lot. He's done it already once or twice in the, the book that we've read already. Just this idea of a, a military charge. You know, I'm giving you orders here, Timothy. Do not do this too quickly. Before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels, listen to what I'm saying here. I command you to listen to what I'm trying to tell you here. This is important. And so whenever Paul does that, we know that's a a very serious thing. Before God and Jesus Christ, before the angels, whoa, okay, what are you going to say? Don't lay hands on people too quickly. This is very serious, you know, is the idea. Uh, Do these things without prejudice, he says doing nothing with partiality. And so without prejudice, without partiality, uh, we will do this. Now, why is it so important? You think of the idea of prejudice, partiality. Well, that's God's nature, right? Without prejudice, without partiality. God is, is not a, he doesn't care what your job is, right? He doesn't care how much money you make. He doesn't care what family you're from. All he cares about is your relationship to him through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? That's all he cares about. We're, our, our jobs, our, our wealth, our stature in society, the family we came from, none of that matters to him. You know, how horrible would it be to see at that white throne judgment people standing there before God? trying to justify why they should get into heaven. Well, you know, I, I won the Nobel Prize. I mean, come on. You, you don't, didn't you see that when I won the Nobel Prize for all the peace and stuff that I did around the world? And don't you remember I was the president of Uruguay? I mean, you know, it doesn't mean anything to God. None of that means anything to him. He has no preconceived notions about who you are he knows who you are he knows righteously who you are and where you stand before him because of your relationship to him through his son Jesus Christ and so he doesn't care about anything else and that is exactly what he expects from us because we can be very prejudicial we can be very uh you know prideful about things and we have our own ideas about who should get what position the partiality I want this person to be in charge no I want this person to be in charge well why is it based on their relationship to Jesus Christ and their walk with the Lord and their depth of maturity in in the scripture and whether they were called to this ministry, uh, whether we've looked at their life and examined uh, their walk with the Lord on a, on a long-term basis, or it's just, boy, he's a good-looking guy. He's so gregarious, isn't he? Oh, he's just, he's a great orator. Did you hear him speak last week? You know, that's a lot of times we're, we're just as bad as the children of Israel. Oh, he's tall and handsome. Let's put him in charge. You know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, sometimes we have our personal uh, thoughts about that 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 override whether we're really making the right decisions. And so these are kind of things that we all need to deal with in the the body of Christ because we can be partial about things. We can be prejudicial about things, but that is not how God operates. And that's not how we should judge each other either. And so you think about that here today. Adam Clark says, Do not treat any man in religious matters according to the rank he holds in life or according to any personal attachment thou mayest have for him. And that's a good word. That's a good word. It doesn't matter what his job is out in town. And a lot of times, you know, we look at that in the church. Well, let's make him an elder. Let's make him a deacon. Why? Well, you know, he's he's this out in town. I don't want to say a lawyer. I keep wanting to say lawyer because that's so... (laughs) respectful but we have a lawyer in the back you know and um but we could make that decision we could make that decision about brian we didn't make that decision about brian being one of our elders uh we saw the godly nature uh, of his life but we sure could have hey brian's a lawyer 
He'll help us on the board, you know. He'd be a great guy to have on the board of elders. He's got all that law information. We could use that, you know. And some churches make those kind of decisions based on that stuff. Based on just purely what they do on the outside, that will help us in the church. And that's not the case. That's not the case. It could be helpful, but it's not the, the reasons that we make those kind of decisions. Connections to them or what they do in life. Every man should be dealt with in the church as he will be dealt with at the judgment seat of Christ. No partiality. No pre- prejudicial judgments. That's how God sees it and that's how we should also uh, take that in turn. And so um, that's all I'm going to say about that. And then we move on there to this very strange statement. It's thrown in here. I just... There's got to be a reason, I'm thinking, you know, that Paul would put this statement. How does it go along with these other verses? And I'm convinced it doesn't. I think Paul was just writing it and then he goes, oh, by the way, you know, you're getting sick all the time, Timothy. Here, take some wine instead of water all the time. I, I don't know any other reason than that. I don't know if it got moved around later by the translators. I don't know. It's, it's a strange statement to be right in the middle of these verses, though, because all the other verses go together. But then he says here, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. And you think about the, the ancient world, uh, if you've ever traveled over in Europe, even today, you know, going over to the Middle East. I remember I went to Pakistan one time. I was sick for three weeks after we left that place. We had to take uh, malaria pills and some other pills for uh, like six weeks before we went in there. And they said, don't drink water anywhere unless you're one of the five-star hotels. And I still got sick as a dog for about three weeks after we left that place. But, uh, you know, here in the United States, we have filtrated water and, and a good system of, of uh, clean water for the most part. Uh, but if you go somewhere else, your stomach's not accustomed to the bugs that are in that place. You've got the bugs here under control, but the bugs somewhere else are going to make you sick. And when you travel, you just get sick inevitably. And so that's what Paul is saying here is take some wine as a medication now, it's interesting, as you talk to Christians today, modern Christians, uh, they will justify alcohol cons- consumption to you, uh, and I'm not here to argue whether Christians can drink alcohol or not, but I do firmly believe that a pastor should not drink alcohol. It's just my conviction based on what I see in Scripture, uh, based on not stumbling people within the church or stumbling anybody else. It's, it's just my own personal conviction. So don't feel you have to take that upon yourself. But as I argue this point with people and debate this point with people, they will inevitably come to this passage. Yeah, but Paul told Timothy he could drink wine. Yes, as a medication. He wasn't saying drink wine on Friday night with your friends and hang out, you know, and and get drunk. He wasn't saying that at all. You can see what he's saying here very clearly. Use wine. And so he's saying use that as a medication for your infirmities because of your stomach problems that you're having. And so uh, I, I think it's pretty easy to see it in that light. But, you know, it does get used to argue that other point that we were talking about. And so uh, it it is kind of thrown in here in the middle of that, and I I want to kind of move on from that point. But if you want to argue with that that later, uh, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll debate it. Come on, let's fight about it. No, iron sharpens iron. It's a good thing. Now, this idea of partiality, again, uh, coming back to that idea, the Bible is, is... you know, replete with these references to this idea of not judging people based on their stature in life. And a great one here in James 2.1, Paul, uh, James says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, You may pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And I think that is a a great way to set up that whole argument. You know, we do have a tendency 
uh, especially people in leadership, you know, you see somebody really rich come in the door, hey boy, they're tithers, so I bet they'll give a lot, you know, and you might have a tendency just in your human flesh to be nicer to that person than you would to say a, a bum that walks through the door who, who you know, they're never going to tithe, they're never going to give any m- amounts of money. And that is just our human nature, that is our human nature to think that way. And, and think about God's heart though. God's heart in the Old Testament and on through the New Testament is you don't judge people based on those kind of things. You know, those people that are poor, those people that are uh, fatherless, the widows, remember, the orphans and, and the stranger, those are the people that we should love even more. Not because of what they can do for us, but because God loves those people. God loves those people and cares for those people dearly, and so should we. And so there is that tendency, again, for the human flesh to judge people based on those kind of things. And we really have to be careful about that in the church uh, because it is a natural tendency that we have. And so uh, moving on from there, uh, getting into this idea again of laying hands on or not laying hands on somebody too quickly. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. And I love that, that point there. Keep yourself pure. Uh, because there is this idea that, you know, when you lay hands on somebody, you are now uh, a part of their sin. You've, you've kind of glorified them to a, whatever position, and now you're a part of that. You're responsible for the sin that they have brought into the church. Uh, rather than keeping it out, you have let it in, is, is kind of the idea. And so do not lay hands on anyone hastily. The idea of patience, prudence, just be slow to judge. Slow to judge. Slow to uh, make a judgment. Uh, don't prejudge based on how somebody looks. Don't have partiality because of how somebody acts, how they talk. Uh, maybe their degrees they have. You know, that's another thing within the church. You know, somebody walks in, they've got a couple degrees from the right universities, and oh, hey, well, <laughs> come on in. You know, you'd be great in the ministry with us here. And there is that, that idea as well. And so, um, but when we do that, we take part in their sin. Whatever sin they end up committing, if we haven't taken that time to uh, be patient with them, uh, we now take part in that. And so there is that. I love this. Patience is a virtue. Possess it if you can. Found seldom in a woman, never in a man. We've said that before. But I would have to say that's so true for me. I'm not saying about any women in here. But for me, uh, patience, boy, that's a tough one, isn't it? We struggle with that, I think, as human beings. We want to rush. We want to get things done. We want to accomplish things. And patience is just such a hard thing to deal with. It is just difficult, and especially in the ministry, you know, I find that um, being patient with things, it's, it's tough, because we only come, you know, on Sunday here, and uh, we only see each other, and we only deal with things on Sundays for the most part, and so it just seems like things just drag on. If you can't get things accomplished, you want to make quick judgments to accomplish something, and, uh, and oftentimes you can wreck the whole thing if you don't. Uh, show some patience. And now, have you ever prayed for patience? Have you ever asked God, give me some patience, Lord? Oh, man, watch out. (laughs) Because patience doesn't come magically, does it? Patience comes as the result of trial and tribulation and uh, persecution oftentimes. A bad situation. You learn patience through those things. You don't learn learn patience any other way than other than being patient in a situation where you don't want to be patient and can't afford to be patient in your own mind. And so there is that, uh, that problem that we face. But it's absolutely critical within the body of Christ, and Paul tells us why here. Because some men's sins, they're clearly evident. The guy walks through the door. You remember a couple years ago, we were meeting over here on a Wednesday night teaching, and this guy walks in. He's got tattoos like all the way up across his neck and uh, he's swearing, he's saying inappropriate things and, you know, we were trying to minister to him the best way that we could, but he was just a mess. He was a guy that I had met at at the uh, U-Turn for Christ ministry, which is kind of a get people out of drugs and alcohol recovery program, a Christian recovery program, but this guy was just a mess, you know, and it was easy, (laughs) hey, 
He's not going to be the assistant pastor. Everybody okay with that? Yep, okay, good. You know, that's an easy judgment to make. I mean, the poor guy. I mean, he was just a mess. Uh, and I, I really felt for him. I felt sorry for him, and we prayed for him, and we tried to minister to him the best that we could. Uh, but, you know, you could just see Satan had a, a grip on this guy's life. And it was just a tragic thing. But sometimes, you know, especially with alcoholism, you know, people, you can see that people are just not fit for ministry very, very quickly because of those kind of things. Uh, And the rest of us sit back and judge. Oh, boy, look at that guy. But, you know, our sins, most of the time, are very easy to keep under wraps, right? The sins that we commit, uh, they're, they're kind of they're swept under the carpet and they're not easily seen. Uh, And so it's easy to judge others that have those very clear evident sins uh, that are destroying their lives. They've destroyed their, their, any opportunity for employment. They've destroyed any opportunity for family involvement. And, you know, a lot of times they end up out on the streets as a result of their sin, just completely destroying their life and taking over their lives. But, um, you know, we shouldn't judge those people because, you know, again, we know that uh, the sins that we deal with, they're just uh, easier to control. They're easier to control and hide from other people. And we show up on Sunday morning and and we wave at each other and say hi to each other and and act spiritual as we raise our hands. But uh, all of us struggle. Is there anybody in this room who doesn't have sin problem? No, no hands. No hands. We all struggle. We all have issues with the tissues, as we say. We all have, uh, you know, a path that we're on. We all have uh, things that God needs to deal with us on. We all have um, hidden sins and, and struggles that we just can't seem to overcome. And we all will have those things until we're in glory, when we're not wearing this flesh suit anymore. When we all get to that place where uh, the flesh doesn't have control over us any, any longer. But in the meantime, um, you know, there are certainly sins that disqualify. There are certainly sins that uh, disqualify for ministry and disqualify for serving. And, uh, and those are definitely some things that follow later. We don't see those things right away. They're just kind of things that eventually crop up as, as time goes by. And so um, that's what Paul's saying here. Uh, just don't be too quick to judge. It's easy to just look and, and make that quick decision, quick judgment. But we need to, you know, weigh these things a little bit. You know, as, as I was talking earlier about um, people coming in and wanting to serve, um, you know, a lot of churches make this, okay, you can't serve for six months, <laughs> which I think is just totally arbitrary. You know, I think it's kind of silly, really. How long have you been coming? Six months? Okay, now you can serve in the children's ministry. But have I spent any time with that person at all in the six months they were here? No. Have I taken them out to, you know, have coffee with them? Has anybody gotten to know them in that six months? No, they've just been here for six months, so magically they're good. You know, that's, that's the kind of judgments that get made sometimes in the church. But, um, you know, as we grow here as a, as, a, as a body, all of us have to take that on. I've been frustrated with our elders in the past, not the elders here, obviously, because they're awesome. They never do anything wrong. But, you know, in in churches and other churches in times past, you know, I've wanted to bring people in and let them serve in certain capacities. And, uh, you know, I don't do that six-month thing. I just try to get to know people. I try to you know, take them out to lunch or take them out for coffee and, and talk with them and hang out with them a little bit and get to know them. And, uh, you know, if after two or three months, I feel comfortable with them. I tell the elders, hey, let's let this guy come in and, and be a deacon or be an elder or, you know, whatever. Not necessarily that level of service after a couple months. But uh, what? He's only been coming here for a month or two, you know, or two months or however long. Yes, and how, how much time have you spent with them? You know, and that falls to all of us here in the body of Christ. You know, when new people come, we need to get to know them. Uh, Not just because we want to see if they can serve or not, but just to show them that love of the body and, uh, and bring them into the fold. But if we all play that role, if we all take that time and take people out to lunch, you know, and uh, there you go, you guys, somebody's going to take you guys out to lunch today. I'm just going to throw that out there. No, I don't don't know. Um, 
you know, but it's great to do that, to get to know people just for the sake of getting to know them and to bless them with the fellowship of the body of Christ. But also, you know, as time goes on, you know, those kind of things start to show. Boy, this person's great, you know. They're just godly people, and, and those kind of things just start reverberating around the church, and it's just known. Yeah, this couple over here, this new couple, they are awesome. You know, let's get them into ministry. Uh, but if nobody takes that time to get to know people, it, it just languishes, and then we put these, these uh, you know, six-month timelines that don't mean anything on it, whether they can serve or not. And so uh, I encourage you guys to, to think about that to uh, just be in the business of getting to know people in the body here. And so um, the other side of that is, is very clear as well, that their good works are going to start show, showing as well, not just the bad things. Uh, I think this is Albert Barnes who said, there ought to be circumspection in judging of the qualifications of men for the office of the ministry. It ought not to be inferred from favorable appearances at once or on slight acquaintance that they are qualified for the office. For they may be of the number of those whose characters now concealed or misunderstood will be developed only after time and trial. And that is a great word, I think, you know. Some people, they show very quickly what kind of person they are. They're a good tree or they're a bad tree. Others, it just takes time and trial for those things to start coming out. And so that is something that all of us should be uh, taking part in, not just leadership. It's just um, getting to know people within the body. And then again, he says there, Likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident, and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. And so they're good works. They can't be hidden. You know, it's just flowing out of them. Uh, we, we look at the, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 and on through there. You know, just this love, joy, peace. Man, it's just coming out of them. You can't help but notice it. It's like you run into somebody out in town or start working with somebody, you know, and you just have this sense. Hey, are you a Christian by any chance? Well, yes, I am, as a matter of fact. How'd you know? It's just oozing out of you. You know, just the love of Christ, the joy, the peace in your heart, the kindness that's there. Now, sometimes uh, it's not the case, but, uh, you know, sometimes we can just have a sense that the Spirit is moving through people. And, and those things, those good works are coming out of them. You know, um, one last thing, I'll, I'll just kind of throw this out there and then we'll close. But so often... Um, and I know I've shared this kind of before, but people that want to be up here on the stage, you know, their, their good works, they show very quickly, and their bad works show very quickly as well. Um, people that want to come up and teach, oh, you want to teach? Good, boy, we really need some people to teach over here in the children's ministry. Oh, no, I don't do that, <laughs> you know. And that's just something I've tried to, you know, find out because that's a test. That's a trial. Now, we want to find out before what kind of person they are before we put them in the children's ministry. But um, that is a good way of finding out, are they serving for the right motivations? Do they have the love of Christ and they're willing to do whatever it takes to serve in the body, whatever need there is out there? Or is there just, hey, I want to get up in front of the people and, and talk. I want to get up there and, and show my stuff, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and so, you know, there are things that we'd like to see people do to serve, to show that it's not just, I, I want to be seen by others. And uh, I remember one guy, he said, I said, why don't you go over and, and teach in the children's ministry? We really need teachers over there. And I knew he was a good guy. I knew he was a good godly man. Um, and there was no doubt about that in my heart, but I was a little questioning whether he just wanted to get up on stage and, and teach. And so I said, I really need you over there. Can you serve over there? No, no, I don't want to do that. He said, I'll serve in any other way, though. I'll clean the toilets, you know, I'll do whatever. I said, well, good. Go talk to Gary. He needs somebody to clean the toilets, too. And the guy just went, oh. I called him on it, you know, and he never came back after that. He never came back to church after that. I think he cleaned the toilets one time and then that was it. He never came back. And so those kind of things, you know, they go into what Paul is saying here. 
does the person have a servant's heart? I'd rather have somebody that has a servant's heart than somebody that can really teach to, to, to be a serving hearer because it's, it's what goes on the heart, their relationship with the Lord. You know, what's the relationship with Jesus? You know, when I was uh, younger and wasn't really walking with the Lord before I came back to really walking with the Lord, and people would ask, you know, um, are you a believer? Are you a Christian? You know, those kind of things. Oh, yeah, my dad was a pastor. You know, I used to say that. Oh, yeah, I have went to church my whole life. My dad was a pastor. That's not what I asked you. Are you walking with the Lord? Do you love Jesus? You know, that's what really matters. Nothing ultimately really matters other than that. God doesn't care what your job is. He doesn't care that your dad was a pastor other than to care for your dad. He doesn't care that you went to church your whole life. What's your relationship with Jesus right now? And that, that's what we judge on. We are called as Christians to be fruit inspectors, right? We shouldn't judge sinners. They're already being judged. And they're already under the condemnation of not knowing who Jesus is and, and our uh, love and mercy should be towards them and our passion to see them get saved. We shouldn't be judging them. But other believers, somebody that claims to be a believer and wants to serve within the body of Christ and wants to be a part of our fellowship here, what's your relationship to Jesus Christ? Are you in love with Jesus? Are you walking with him? Do you have that close relationship with him? Because that's the only thing the Father's going to judge you on. And so that's what we're going to judge on as well. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you and just thank you again for your word. Lord, we thank you for the patience that you have with us. Lord, other men's sins are clearly seen. And we can judge for that reason because ours are not as visible. But Father, we ask that you would come today, Lord, that you would purge our hearts of the hidden sins that we keep. Lord, we want to stay pure before you and holy and to have that closer walk with you, to be more and more in love with your son Jesus and more thankful for what he has done on our behalves. We praise you for his work on the cross, Lord. And Lord, we ask that from this point forward, we would not prejudge. We would not have partiality. We would not look upon the outer man, the outer woman. But Lord, we would just patiently and with purity just sit back and watch and be fruit inspectors loving them and welcoming them in, but not laying hands too quickly. Lord, we, pay for, we pray for that patience that only comes over the course of time, over the course of trial and, and anguish and, and waiting. Lord, give us the patience that we need to put the right people into place so that your ministry will go on with power, and authority, that the ministry here at this church would give glory to you in everything that we say and do. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.